right, good morning, everybody. So I've got about, I don't know, 16, 17 minutes to share with y'all, and then we're going to have our annual children's uh, Christmas play. Um, today I'm finishing up the series that Pastor Keith started, Not Feeling It. We've been going through the stages of the uh, Advent season. We've had hope and peace and joy. Today I'm going to be sharing with you about love. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jonathan Taylor. I'm the executive pastor here at April Sound Church, and I love it. Uh, it's wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and dive right in. We're going to read a passage out of 1 John. This is chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 7 through 11. And it looks like, oh, I thought I lost my bookmark for a second there. All right. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God loved us, we also ought to love one another. So what I'd like to do is uh, zero in on a part of that passage, and that part is that God is love. Uh, the idea that God is love, I think, was a world-changing one. I don't think that a lot of people thought of God as being love before Jesus came. I think also that we struggle to believe it now. I think that if John had not written this verse that explicitly says God is love, we would probably have a hard time coming to grips with believing that. God is love. And sometimes when we have conversations with other people about what God is like, we'll bring that up. Uh, I've had it happen a number of times where I'm having a conversation with somebody, we're talking about what God is like, and, and I'll remind them, God is love. And then inevitably somebody will say, yeah, God is love, but he's also a judge. God is love, but he's, he's also, he has wrath. God is love, sure, but he created hell. And it always rubs me the wrong way when somebody says something like that. You know, it's like, you know those people that just love to smash your hopes? <laughs> it feels like that. Like they just suck all the wind out of your sail when they say something like that. But I think there's two things that are really wrong with it. The first one is that a person who says something like that really believes that it's dangerous to overestimate how good God is. Like if you think God's too good, you're going to get yourself in trouble. You're going to end up off in sin or something like that. And so they feel like they're protecting you, but they're mistaken. You cannot overestimate how good God is. I mean, you could misestimate it. Maybe. <laughs> Why are we having mic problems? But, but you can't overestimate how good God is. He's much better than we could ever come up with, that our imagination could conceive of. When, when Moses saw God's goodness, it made his face glow. Like his face was so bright. They said it was as bright as the noonday sun. People couldn't stand to look at him. They made him put a rag on his head so they wouldn't get blinded. The goodness of God is way better than we could imagine. There is no risk in overestimating his goodness. The other thing is that... Uh, in order to, uh, when somebody says God is good, but, uh, but he's also a judge, for example, what they're really saying is that when God judges, he does so independently of love. That he just turns his love off for a minute so that he can do the business of judging. He turns his love off and separates himself from it so that he can have wrath or so that he can create hell. And that just simply cannot be because God is love. Love is not an attribute of God. He does have attributes. We could say that he's omnipotent, he's omniscient, he's sovereign, all these things. These are attributes of God, but it's not necessarily like his essence. And you can look at, at something like the Trinity, for example. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have always been, and they have always loved each other. Before anything was created, love existed between the persons of the Godhead. But wrath didn't. What would they have been mad at each other about? Judgment didn't. What would the father have been judging the son about? Love has always been there because love is what God is. It's who he is. It's part of his essence. It's the essence of his being. 
Now, that's important. I think that's a really good thing to know. A lot of people have gotten a hold of this truth, uh, and there's a movement in the church right now where they take this idea that God is love and use it to interpret Scripture or to interpret the things that happen in our lives. And the way it works is, you know, you, you'll be reading something in Scripture, you come across a passage where it seems like God is doing something that is not love. And so you have to stop and say, okay, wait a minute, no, God is love. He's not doing something independently of love right now. He's not separating himself from it or turning it off. There has to be some other way of understanding this passage or this experience that I'm going through that, that rem where God remains love, okay? And I think that's a great idea, but it has its problems too. Uh, for one, all that can really do is tell you what's not. You know, you, you can... You can you just basically come to that conclusion, God is not separating himself from love in this situation. Whatever it was that God did, if he, even if it's like there's stuff in the Bible that's hard to accept. God killed people. God pronounced curses over people. He did things that look like it's not love, but we have to step back and remind ourselves, no, love did that. It like What I'm saying is it's not like when God created hell, that was the one thing God did that, outside of love. No, love did that. Wrath is an expression of love. If, uh, if I love you, I'm going to be angry about you being hurt. That's basically the way wrath works. Another issue we have with this idea of using God is love as sort of an interpretive model or a lens through which we view scripture and everything else is that uh, we end up doing something kind of like idolatry. And here's how it works. Here's one guy. One guy would apply it like this. He would say, well, I just believe that love means telling sinners they're going straight to hell to burn forever. And if they don't repent and clean their act up, that's it. Some other guy takes the same idea and says, well, I just believe that love means accepting everybody. And you don't have to change because God loves you just the way you are. And we end up with very different beliefs about God, starting with this same standard that God is love. And the reason is because we all have different definitions of love. There's only one way to really qualify or understand what God is really like. And it's through looking at Jesus. The only way we can understand what God is like is by looking at Jesus. Jesus is the exact representation of the glory of God, according to Hebrews 1. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In Colossians, Scripture says that the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. If you want to know what God is like, you have to look at Jesus. But there's this interesting coincidence. Since God is love... If you look at Jesus to better understand what God is like, you're also going to end up better understanding what real love is. You know, there's we, most of us have experienced love in our lives. We've maybe fallen in love with somebody at some point, or we have kids and we just deeply love our children. Maybe it's our parents, our siblings. We've had relationships where we've experienced love, and it's a great experience. It's one that you would choose to have if you were given the opportunity. If God said to you, hey, if you want next week, I'm going to allow you to experience an immense amount of love for, for somebody else, would you like that? Most of us would say yes, because it's a really good experience. And like, I enjoy loving my wife because it makes me feel good. And so there's this element of our normal relational love that we have with each other that's a little bit selfish. I don't think it's like sin selfish, but it is a little bit self-centered. But when we look at Jesus, what we find is that the God kind of love is not self-centered. Jesus said, there's no greater love than this, than that a man lay down his life for his friends. The kind of love that Jesus expressed was centered on others. He laid down his life for us. He wasn't focused on himself and how good the feeling of love made him feel. He was focused on us and what would benefit us the most. Likewise, his love was self-sacrificial. We call it passion. When, when we get to Easter, you'll hear the word passion being used. And what it refers to is actually suffering. It's the kind of love that results in suffering. You know, the, the series that we're on, Not Feeling It, part of the point is that these things, hope, peace, joy, and love, they're not just feelings. There's something much bigger and grander 
about them. They're fruits of the Spirit. They're things that God cultivates within us. And when it comes to love, it is more than a feeling. And, it, and the more feeling that it is, is a bad one. It's a feeling that many of us would not choose. Even Jesus, before he was about to be crucified, said to the Father, it, it, he said, if there's any way that this cup could pass from me, let it be, but not my will, yours be done. He didn't want to suffer, right? It's something that we probably wouldn't choose. I'm going to give you a, a little illustration of this, of how, how this might apply to us, because the, the, so far the only example I've given is laying down your life. I don't think most of us are being called by God right now to like literally die out of love. Now that does happen. There are martyrs. But I'm going to give you a more uh, probably practical example. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul is correcting the Corinthian church over the fact that in that church, Christians were suing each other. They were taking each other to court, to court and suing each other. And he makes the case that when you do something like that, you're bringing shame to the body of Christ. You're, you're bringing shame to Christ himself. You remember Jesus said, the world will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. So when we start taking each other to court and suing each other, how do you think the world interprets that? Do they see, do they see us as being united in Christ? If they know what Jesus taught, do they see us as being obedient to Christ? They don't. It makes a bad name for the church and for Christ himself. The world would then in that arena see us as no different than themselves. And so he gives these reasons why they shouldn't be suing each other. But then he asks them this question, and it's a really profound question. And I'm going to ask you the question. I'm going to ask you to really examine your heart for the true answer to this question. But I'm going to lay out a scenario first and then ask it, okay? So here's the scenario. Somebody in the church has defrauded you. It's cost you money. You lost a lot of money over it. It subjected you to, to shame and humiliation. You're deeply offended. But you know that you have an airtight case. If you hire a lawyer and file a lawsuit against this person, you will absolutely win. You'll get your damages covered, probably some pain and suffering as well. You got it made. This is an easy case. The question I'm going to ask is not whether or not you sue them. This is the question Paul asked the Corinthian church. Wouldn't you rather be wronged? Wouldn't you rather just be cheated? That's the question he asks them. So what would you, what would you do? Would you rather be wronged than get justice if it meant getting it from another person from the church? Would you rather be cheated or would you rather get revenge? Would you rather be wronged or would you rather punish the person who wronged you? You know, just judging by simple observation of my years being in the church, I can sadly say that I think most Christians would rather take revenge, would rather punish, would rather file the lawsuit against their own brother. But this is the kind of love that we've been loved with. Jesus loved us this way. I think a really great way to summarize the gospel, at least part of it, is that First of all, recognize that in, in a certain way, we are responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus, right? It was, uh, he became sin for us. He became us. He died on the cross as us, right? So in that sense, I'm thinking of that. Uh, you remember that song, uh, How Deep the Father's Love? It was my sin that held him there. Remember? We are partly, we're, we were responsible for the crucifixion. Context. Um, Here's the summary. The Son of God loves you so much that he would rather die than defend himself if defending himself meant that he had to hurt you. He would rather be wronged than defend himself if it meant that he had to hurt you to do it. That's the kind of love we've all been loved with. And that's the kind of love that God is calling us to love each other with. We may not be being called to lay down our lives, but often we're called to lay down our egos. We're, we're called to lay down our pride, our reputations. And these things matter to us because people fight and steal and kill and all that for those things. Now, we're also talking about this as, as being the fruit of the Spirit. 
I don't know about you, but when I read the list of the fruit of the Spirit, I've had this experience a lot of times where I'll, I'll be reading it and I'll get to something like patience and I'll think to myself, wow, I, I'm not doing a very good job of being patient. I really need to work on that. And get down to love. Ah, oh, I haven't been doing a very good job of being loving lately. I, I really need to work on that. And one day it occurred to me that there's something wrong with that because it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of self-effort. See, the fruit of the Spirit is something that God cultivates and causes to happen. As, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says, One man plants, another man waters, but it's God who gives the increase. Now, there's two passages in the Gospels that, that address this. How, what do we do? What, what's our part in producing fruit? Uh, Terrell went over one of them in his message. Uh, that's the, the true vine passage there in John 15, where Jesus says, If you abide in me, you will produce fruit. Right? I'm summarizing. The other one, though, is the parable of the sower. So first off, abiding in Christ. If we abide in Christ, that's it. Fruit will happen. But if you look at the parable of the sower, I'll try to summarize it real quick. I've got about one minute left. You've got four different types of soil, right? They all receive the seed, which is the word of God. Only one of them ends up actually producing fruit. What did the one, the fertile soil, what did it do that caused fruit to be produced? The answer is nothing. It did nothing. See, the problem is the other three did something, and the something they did resisted God. One of them had a hard heart. The, se the word couldn't penetrate. One of them had the deceitfulness of riches, the cares of this life, the lust for other things. It competed against the word. It couldn't produce fruit. What was the other one? Rocky soil. It was shallow. They didn't let it get deep. The other one was hard-hearted. So that's the answer. If we want to produce fruit, all we have to do is abide in Christ and don't resist him. You know, put the seed in your heart. Put the seed of the word of God in your heart. Abide in Christ. Don't resist him. And fruit will happen. We don't need to work hard on being loving or being patient or being kind. Those kinds of things will happen automatically if we abide in him, put the word in our heart, and just don't resist him. All right, I think it's about time for our children to come in. Do you know if they're ready, Pastor Keith? <laughs> all right yeah father uh i just ask that every person who can hear me right now that you would grant them to be rooted and grounded in your love that they would be able to comprehend together with all of the saints what is the length and breadth and depth and height of your love that they would know the love of christ that passes knowledge that they would be filled with all of the fullness of god and now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that's at work in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen.